If you have your Bibles, we are again in a series on the Gospel of Matthew. We find ourselves in chapter 26 today. We are going to ambitiously try to get through all of chapter 26 and chapter 27 today. Very powerful, powerful chapters that this entire series has been leading up to. And today we arrive. We're going to start in verse 1 of Matthew 26, but let's ask God to bless our message. Let's pray. Father, this time I pray that you speak, either through me or in spite of me. Let those with ears to hear, hear the word. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. Right away, we see a wretched evil. This is like a surgeon who is murdering his patients on the operating table or a mother who is drowning her children. These are the religious people of God's chosen people, the religious leaders of God's chosen people gathering together in the court of the high priest in the place where divine justice is supposed to be administered and they are plotting to assassinate the Messiah. This is true evil. Look at verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And when she poured the perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, whether, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It mentions an alabaster jar. The jar itself would have been a work of art. A flask made out of one piece of alabaster. And it contained this fragrant oil that was so costly that it was only reserved for very important special occasions. Now most of these jars did not actually have lids. They did not actually have corks. There was nothing actually at the top. And so the only way to actually use this perfume was to break off the top of this bottle. And once you did that, you're kind of on the clock. You sort of need to use all of the perfume all at once. But you can imagine the collective gasp as she stood before the Lord and she snapped off this very expensive top to this bottle and she poured all of its contents in his hair. And I suspect that had the other disciples realized what she was about to do, they probably would have physically tried to stop her because of the great expense. So much money gone to waste. Look at verse 14. We're in Matthew chapter 26. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Now the betrayal gets even more personal. This is not nameless religious leaders. It is one of the 12. And this is not even a lot of money. In fact, Exodus prescribes this exact amount of money, 30 pieces of silver. If your ox escapes and hurts your neighbor, this is how much you're supposed to repay. Verse, 20, verse 17 of Matthew 26. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And he replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Picture your last Thanksgiving meal or picture the last time your family was gathered together at Christmas. Who was around that table? Or what about the last time you were gathered for a meal with your closest friends, the people that you love the very most? It's the same here in this meal with Jesus. These are Jesus' closest friends gathered for a meaningful meal when the Lord suddenly looks at them and says, it's one of you. 
The betrayal starts right here in this room. Verse 22. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely you don't need me, surely you don't mean me, Lord. What's interesting is they don't even question that this level of betrayal is possible. They just question whether they're the ones that are going to do the betraying. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Rabbi? Judas is in the process of betraying the Messiah, of stabbing him in the back, and now he can't call him Lord like the rest of the disciples, but instead he just manages to get out the word Rabbi. Jesus answered, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of the forgiveness, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung, sung a, a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And the other disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with them, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will. But as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, He again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put my disposal more than twelve legion of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that says, it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple corpse teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and he sat down with the guards to see the outcome. 
The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they didn't find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say this to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy! Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit on his face and struck him with their fists, and others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And he denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. And after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. And then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. You know, the lack of, of loyalty and betrayal in this chapter is, it's ugly and it's, it's rotten. Israel's leaders are, are desperate and they are weak and they are blinded by their envy, their hatred of this man Jesus. Judas, one of Jesus' closest followers, sells him out for a few pieces of silver. And then you have the disciples who in one moment are saying, I will never forsake you. I will never betray you. And then the next moment, they can't even stay awake while he is in agony in prayer. And he specifically asks them three times, would you just stay awake? And they can't even do that. Then you have Peter. Poor Peter who is... In one moment, declaring that he'll never betray Jesus. In another moment, he's cutting off a servant's ear. And then another moment, he's saying, I don't even know this man. You know, there's a saying that what is something worth? It's worth what someone is willing to pay for it. If you've ever sold anything, you know this to be true. You know, how much should you price your house for? Well, you should price it in a way that one person will be willing to pay that price. And that's really what your house is worth. It doesn't matter what the bank says. It really doesn't matter, you know, what your realtor says. It really just matters what is one person willing to pay. It doesn't matter if you're selling a house or a baseball card or a car or anything in between, a work of art. Something is worth what someone is willing to pay for. Well, what is Jesus worth in this chapter? To at least one woman, he's worth the most expensive perfume she could get her hands on. And yet to Judas... Jesus is worth less than 30 pieces of silver. To the, to the disciples, he's not even worth staying awake for. And to Peter, he's certainly not worth getting arrested for. In our lives, we will all sacrifice for things that we really, really want. You know, you'll save money and put it aside all year long so that your kids can have a magical Christmas. You're willing to sacrifice all year long if you know that there is a wonderful vacation that is coming. If you invest in your retirement, you're doing the same thing. I value this retirement that I'm seeking. Or if you willingly give up anything, your time, your money, your resources, you do that because there's something that you value even more. We make sacrifices for our material comfort, for even our hobbies and passions. In other words, we prioritize what matters most to us. And sometimes, even those priorities are above our devotion to Jesus. Just as Judas betrayed Jesus and Peter denied him, we too have chosen our desires over following Christ wholeheartedly. We have drawn lines in what we are willing to pay. We fail to give Jesus 
the entirety of our lives. The corruption and betrayal that's displayed by Israel's leaders and Judas, the half-heartedness of the disciples, even the denial of Peter, that all lives in our heart too. And before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to understand that it is something that's also done by us. That same level of have heartedness and betrayal. It lives in us too, but please listen carefully. Please understand this. This message, this entire series is not about getting you to sacrifice more for Jesus. It's not even about urging you to love Jesus more because that's not the essence of the gospel. Because what we see is Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that Peter would disown him. He knew the disciples would abandon him. And he knew that we would prioritize other things over our loyalty to him. And he died for us and them anyway. Jesus, he sees you. He knows you. And he loves you. He is crazy about you. He was fully aware of what you would do and what you wouldn't do. And despite our betrayals, he loves us unconditionally. Make no mistake about it. Your sin put Jesus on the cross. But this message is not about getting you to sacrifice more for Jesus. It's about understanding the depths of his sacrifice for you. It's about recognizing that even when we prioritize other things, Jesus remains steadfast in his love for us. As we turn the chapter, I will warn you, we're about to see the true shame of it all. But we're also going to see that for Jesus, no price was too high. Look at chapter 27 of Matthew, starting in verse 1. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans of how they were going to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, they led him away, and they handed him over to Pilate, the governor, When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. And he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and to the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas Judas threw the money into the temple and he left. Then he went away and he hanged himself. Judas' end is tragic, but it's not unforeseen. He recognizes Jesus' innocence, but he is incapable of seeing Jesus' mercy extending to him. Verse 6, the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it's been called the field of blood to this day. And then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Jesus is on the way to the cross, and even his betrayal becomes somehow redemptive. The money used to betray him is used to buy a barrel plot for foreigners. Matthew doesn't want us to miss this point. Jesus is what God has been up to all along. And the people most likely to miss it are the powerful people. Look at verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, Pilate asked. 
But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. None of this makes sense to Pilate. He doesn't see the legitimacy of the charges, but he does see Israel's envy. He understands what's happening. His wife says, don't do it, because she has uh, this feeling, I guess a dream she has. And he's got this criminal to barter with, but the crowd is loud, and the conversation isn't getting anywhere. And so he just says, it's your responsibility. Jesus paid a very high price. He was innocent. Pilate knew he was innocent. He didn't break any Roman laws. He could clearly see what was going on, but the governor, he wanted to symbolically wash his hands of it all, and yet his indifference doesn't mean he is blameless. Jesus is innocent. He dies anyway. The crowd chooses Barabbas, even while Jesus chooses to die for the crowd. Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. They took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene, a man named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and another on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, and save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on his staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out it again in a loud voice, He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs were broken open. The bodies of the many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. And they exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As a minister, I've been around death and dying, probably more than most. And mostly what I see is very peaceful deaths. Mostly it's someone dies, they're surrounded by family and there's a lot of love, there's a lot of care. There's sadness, of course, but There's the peace that comes from knowing you're there next to your loved one. The death of Jesus, it wasn't peaceful. Matthew, in fact, tells this dramatic 
earth-shattering, tomb-opening fashion of a story. It wasn't peaceful. Jesus' death was violent, and it was chaotic. A Roman execution was meant to be violent and chaotic. They would drive nails that were 8 to 15 inches in length into your wrist between the two bones. They would also tie ropes around your arms to make sure that you stayed there. They would cruelly, even though nailing your feet to the cross, they would put a little slab of wood at the bottom so that you could at times raise yourself up for a little bit of a break from the weight of those nails. But it really was only to make the whole thing even more agonizing and last longer. And insultingly, get you to decide when you died because eventually you would be so tired you could no longer raise yourself up and you would sink down and your lungs would fill with fluid and you would suffocate and you would die. And you're the one that decided when that moment happened. Can you name someone before Jesus who was crucified by the Romans? No. You know why? It's by design. When you're crucified, your name goes away. It's a humiliating, painful death that's meant to make you nameless forever. That's why you don't know anyone besides Jesus that was crucified. Earthquakes and darkness, the temple, curtain torn open. Matthew even says dead people start to walk around. This isn't a peaceful death. All of the people who plotted his death, they got their wish. Pilate's will was done. The soldiers who were coldly efficient in their whipping and their nailing and their watch keeping. And even the crowds, they see his limp body and there's no doubt they just kind of walked away. No more to see. On to the next debasement. On to the next murder. Because we all know there's going to be another one somewhere. Bloodlust is never satisfied. Except, except for one soldier. One Roman soldier who is standing at the foot of the cross. And suddenly this soldier has some eyes of faith and he says, truly this was the Son of God. The death of Jesus immediately leads to one person having faith. And this is the first confession of faith after the death of Jesus and it comes from a Roman soldier. I don't care who you are, you did not see that coming. From the moment Jesus dies, someone sees life in it. And that's our job too. Our call is to find life through death. If a Roman soldier with Jesus' literal blood on his hands can declare him to be the Son of God, then anyone can find life through Jesus' blood. And his confession is our call. We as Christians find life by embracing the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. It's him living in me. We find life in death. Let's keep reading the end of chapter 27 of Matthew. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. And going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate offered that it be given to him. And Joseph took the body, and he wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and he placed it in his own tomb that he had cut out of the rock. And he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I'll rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he has been raised from the dead. And that deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate replied. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Make the tomb as secure as you know how. It really was secure. These stones that they rolled in place would be up to two tons in weight. It was actually put in a track that would be basically rolled into place by going downhill, which meant if you wanted to remove it, you would have to roll it uphill. And by the way, it says, send a guard. That makes it sound like for us, there's one. There's not. There was 10 to 16 in a guard. This was several soldiers that were putting the stone in place. And then he says, that they say, put a seal on it. 
Romans had a special way of sealing anything. They would use a clay tablet, usually, or wax, and it would have the Roman imperial stamp upon it so you could see if it had been disturbed, and usually there would be ropes that were tied around that as well. And so if anyone came and tried to mess with this tomb, the Romans would know. Nobody stole Jesus' body. Pilate made sure of that. So they walked away with a smile on their face. Job's done. We're done with this guy and his followers. Let's go home. But just wait till chapter 28, boys. It's a whole new chapter. I want to end with a question this morning. I wonder if anyone here has rolled a stone over their heart. Maybe you're here this morning and you have doubts that Jesus really was the Son of God. I wonder if you've rolled a stone in front of your heart, you've wrapped a rope around it, and you've put a seal there, and yet the more you fight it and the more you try to push him away, the more you set a guard there and seal the stone over your heart, the more he taps from the inside, I'm still here. I still love you. I still want you. I forgive you. If that's you this morning, I just want to say to you, roll away the stone from your heart. Declare Jesus really is the Son of God and find life from his death. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for his life that was lived perfectly because, Lord, we can't do that. At some point, we prioritize something else besides you. We turn away. We do something or say something or don't do something or say something that separates us from you with our sin. And we needed Jesus to come and live that perfect life, and he did. We thank you for him. Lord, we also thank you for the sacrifice he was willing to make for us. We thank you for his willingness to take the abuse and the insults, the nails, and the agonizing death. May we find life through that death. And Father, in the places in our lives where we've rolled a stone and we don't want you to venture there, Lord, break away that stone. Please roll it away. Give us the courage to cooperate with you in that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've not declared that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you've not obeyed his command to be baptized, I invite you just a moment to come forward while we stand up and sing and we'll help you declare what that Roman centurion said. He really is the Son of God. We'll help you symbolically go through the death, burial, and resurrection where you die to your old self and you're buried in the water and you're raised up to walk a new life. If you've not made that decision, don't leave here this morning without making it. Perhaps what you need this morning is someone to pray for you. We want to do that as well. In a moment we stand and sing, don't come forward, go to the back. I see the Wilsons back there. One of our shepherds and his wife, they would love to pray with you back there. But the rest of us, as we stand and sing, I invite you to declare and celebrate that truly Jesus was the Son of God. Celebrate the life that comes from his death. Make the decision you need to. Always stand up and sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, God.